fuck is this? Alright guys, welcome back. Today, we're taking a look at one of my newer acquisitions. My FEG uh, Browning High Power Clone. This is the FEG model PJK9HP. This is pretty much an exact uh, Browning High Power Clone made in Hungary. So, let's go over a, just a little bit of the history on the, on this uh, this gun. I don't have a whole lot of ton of specifics on it. Some of the stuff's a little vague on it. Uh, pretty much, um, Hungary was looking at producing some uh, sidearms for themselves and also for export. And uh, they pretty much really liked the Browning High Power uh, uh, platform. And, well, they copied it and started producing it. Now, I've seen some sources say that they had license to copy it. And I've seen other sources say they did not have license to copy it. So, um, that is what it is. I'm not sure 100% what the actual, uh, you know, legality behind what the... The, the, if there was patent infringement or whatnot on it. Now, as far as these go, they are almost as close to a true Browning high power you can get. And as far as I can I can tell from my research, most of the parts are compatible with actual Browning handguns. So a lot of the parts are direct swap over. So that's kind of cool if you get one of these. You know, they're a lot cheaper than a, a real Browning uh, high power, but you're going to have some part interchangeability there as well. I don't know if, like, the, uh, you know, upgrade triggers and springs. Uh, as far as I know, springs are fine. But I don't know about, you know, some of the internals, the more uh, precise parts, whether those are 100%, um, you know, interchangeable or not. I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but from what I've, I've read, almost completely is. So... These were used in quite a few com block countries. Um, Hungary, obviously, I know they use them for the police forces. I can't remember if I read if the actual military used them or not. They probably did. Um, I do know that the Israeli military did use these, and so did the police force. The police force used them more than the, the military did, but some were in military circulation. Um, and they were using these before uh, uh, they developed the Jericho. Um, I believe in the time frame that they were using these, they were using these and also some CZ-75s and, you know, other s stuff like that. Pretty much anything they can get their hands on, but they did buy a bunch of these. And there's even, you know, a couple videos online with reviews of these that were Israeli, um, handguns. You know, the, uh, some of them have Israeli markings and stuff like that. So that's kind of interesting. I wasn't aware of that when I got this gun as part of a trade, but... Now that I do, it's kind of interesting because it kind of goes towards my Israeli firearm collection. Now I do, it's, you know, that's the case. I am going to try to locate an actual Israeli one that has Israeli markings. And if I can, uh, that would be awesome. I'd prefer to have that over this because this one here just, you know, says hungry on it. Um, but, you know, I'd rather have one that actually has the, you know, the Israeli markings as well. Um, as you can see, unlike the, uh, the CZ-75s, uh, you know, the uh, platform that I'm so in love with, which is based on the Brown and High Power, this is not a double action, this is only a single action, uh, handgun, which is fine with me, um, a lot of the... Uh, handguns that came out of the comp block around this time, you know, in the, you know, 40s, 50s, uh, all the way up into pretty much the, the, the 70s, uh, were all, you know, single action anyway, so there's nothing wrong with that, um, but it does have a relatively nice pull. Now, uh, the problem with these were is that they had a magazine disconnect on them, which means if the magazine was out, you could not pull the trigger, or drop the hammer, or anything like that. You had to have the magazine in it. Now, that also caused it to have a heavier trigger pull uh, and kind of a crunchy trigger pull. So a common uh, upgrade on these is simply removing that magazine disconnect, which I already did on this. Pretty much you remove 
this pin right here on the trigger and then you remove disconnect I'll show you that here when I disassemble the gun so that's something to, to keep an eye out if you see if you come across these and it doesn't have the pin there you don't have to put it back but if it doesn't have the pin in the trigger then you know it's already had the disconnect taken out um, part of the reason I took it out is one for you know the uh, you know the shootability on it increase that trigger pull and, and all that to crispness but also if uh, I didn't take it out I couldn't ghost the trigger um, for the trigger test later on now interesting fact about the Browning high power as a platform in, in general this was actually the last handgun that John Moses Browning worked on and unfortunately he never got to see it finished out and made it to market he started working on the design and was part of that team and got most of it figured out but he never uh, I don't know if he got some prototypes built before he died but he never uh, seen it go to actual market into production so that's kind of sad but it's kind of interesting that the, the Browning high power is his last legacy pistol so let's take the disassembly and check it out so it's pretty much similar to uh, most uh, of Browning's guns uh, in 1911 you have this disassembly catch like it normal and this pin that you push out the difference is is you take the safety and there's this little catch right here and that's not the slide release um, the, the slide lock the slide lock locks up here but uh, that's a disassembly catch so what you do is you move it up and you hook that disassembly catch on the safety now at this point usually you can just push it straight out on most handguns you can't on this you have to actually push that uh, that slide catch up and then you can push it out and it comes completely out then you can drop the safety come straight off and pull out your recoil spring like so and your barrel comes out um, very standard it's the Browning high power locking system exactly as uh, intended one of my favorite locking systems now on this uh, on this gun uh, it does have an over travel uh, firing pin so if you look where the firing pin is here and where it comes out if you have the firing pin flushly depressed Uh, it's a little bit more than flush because it's a round screw. The firing pin does not protrude out the front of the, the block here. So in theory, it is safe to carry this gun with a round in the chamber and the hammer down. Now, it is still possible that when dropping the gun, if you land on the hammer, some of that kinetic energy could transfer through the hammer stationary without it moving into the firing pin and could possibly have enough energy to detonate the cartridge. Um, that's always possible but uh, it's still unlikely you'd have to drop it with enough force and hit it just right on the hammer to transfer that energy through kinetic uh, uh, means like that um, nothing super special on the barrel just your basic browning locking lugs you got your markings on it serial lumber stuff like that none too crazy now when you reassemble this this little this little uh, lug here has to go a certain way and there's actually a groove here in the middle of the uh, barrel uh, where the locking lug goes so see this way yeah so there's a little flat piece here that flat piece goes down actually no it's the other way around it flips around so if you have it the wrong way it will actually stick out a little bit off on the side and the gun won't won't reassemble so Turn it around, that flat piece goes up. And then when installed correctly, it sits in the center of that, and that's how you know it's good to go. Now, interesting design on the way this is set up. It doesn't have four rails down the entire length of the frame. It only has the two rails here and the two rails here. So that's kind of interesting. So as I mentioned earlier, that slide release, that slide lock, uh, would have sat right down there in that small groove. Um, but like I said, I took that out so we can have a nice good uh, crisp, uh, you know, pull on the trigger. Disassembly, or reassembly is the same way as the disassembly. Just take it back, 
slide it up to that safety. Reassemble your the pin, and you don't necessarily have to hold it up when you put it back in, and we're good to go. Now on the safety on this, uh, well, let's go over the controls. So real basic controls, nice uh, for for extended um, mag release here. It's got some nice checkering on it. It sticks out a good good ways. That's nice. Not ambi, but you know, guns at this time that wasn't really a thing yet. The safety on it, it's real basic safety. You cannot engage the safety if the hammer is down. But you can engage it on that first cock. And once the first cock's there, disengage with the trigger. You can't disengage you can't do anything with the hammer. You can't do anything with the slide. You can at full cock also engage it. Same thing. Hammer can't do anything. Slide can't do anything. You know, gun is, is, is safe. The safety itself, very slow, uh, very short pull uh, and swing on it. And it's kind of, you know, tight up in here. It does have really good grip on it. But it is a little stiff and not very tactile. You don't really hear a, a good click either way. So that could be improved, but it could be just the age of this gun itself. So let's go ahead and uh, ghost the trigger on it. So we're going to start here. We got all that that's just free space. And then we hit the first wall. No movement, no movement, no movement. There was a slight creep and then it, it broke. Otherwise, not too bad. I'd have to say maybe the pulls seven pounds maybe so so when you actually when you slide when you actually rack it back the trigger actually depresses further back than where it actually fires at and that's kind of important for later on so the reset you got a little creep out creep out it's a smooth creep too there's, there's not like chunkiness And then right there, real subtle, quiet um, reset. And then you're at that wall again and goes. Overall, without the mag, uh, mag disconnect in it, a really nice trigger. Uh, you do have to move it further out to, di uh, to do the reset than I would like. But overall, nice. Now, the problem that I was having with this gun during shooting is it the recoil's not bad on it, but it is slightly snappy. Um, so there was a couple times in which I was firing, and during recoil, it would go back, causing me to let off the trigger and do the reset. And during my rebound, while it was still kind of under recoil, it was kind of easy to set off a second shot. Which isn't too bad, it isn't that big a deal if you're on target, but not ideal. Part of that can be just, with training with a specific gun, can be overcome. Um, that's just a quirk of this specific gun, so that's not that big a deal. But something to keep in mind, that you don't want to accidentally pop off for that second shot second shot when you don't need to now one of the main problems that these uh, guns are known for is extracting issues now I've experienced this a couple times in my videos uh, or in my filming I actually did a full shooting segment with this gun uh, about three weeks ago and I have no idea what happened to that footage but in that footage I use nothing but you know practice ball you know brass case and what happens is sometimes the, the extractor just doesn't grab the rim and the cartridge is in there and you got to drop the mag and, and set, uh, you know, dro drop the slide back down and then, you know, pull it out. Now, um, that can be remedied just simply by replacing the extractor with a browning extractor. Um, every word that I've read says that once you replace the extractor, 
that fixes the problem. You don't have that issue anymore. Now, I did experience that one time uh, with the shooting that footage I did today because the first mag I shot was brass case uh, practice ammo. Now, on the other hand, all the rest of my shooting I did was with this aluminum case blaze. And this aluminum case had zero issues extracting out of this gun whatsoever. While using this blaze aluminum case ammunition, I had zero malfunctions at all. So, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, a lot of people don't like this aluminum case uh, ammunition. I personally don't mind it. I've never had an issue with it. Um, I've heard people say primers can blow out of them. They can crack cases. You can't really reload them. Stuff like that. But as far as a shooting uh, perspective, I don't have much issue with them. They shoot good, you know. Uh, not much more you need to you know, know about that. But that's something to keep in mind is pretty much just that extractor issue is the only real operating issue that I'm aware of on this platform and that I personally experienced. And out of all my shooting, the last time I shot maybe 200 rounds through it with brass case, I had that issue occur maybe five, six times out of 200. Not terrible, but definitely not something you want to uh, bet your life on. Uh, but not hard to clear either. You know, drop your mag a little bit, rack it, and then, you know, slide it back, in, back real fast, you know. And, uh, you know, actually, I think I had two. I might have had two malfunctions while I was well, using that first magazine. Uh, so, that's something to, to, to think of, and that's something I probably am going to do, is I'm going to see if there's a upgraded um, browning extractor claw and then use that. Now... The finish on this gun is actually pretty nice. So, it's a possibility that this gun might be a good candidate for a complete refinish. Um, because this, there's no proof that this specific gun was a service gun of any kind. Um, and it was probably just a direct import into the U.S. when they were doing it. Uh, I don't feel so bad about, you know, polishing this off and giving it a nice shiny blue. So that's something I may do as far as the finish on it. Um, like I said, you know, if it was a surplus one and it had, you know, uh, you know, proof marks or something like that or something that showed that it was in military service, I'd leave the finish alone. But um, I don't have any proof of that with this particular gun. Uh, and as far as I know, there's not really a way to look it up and see. Anyway, so moving on. So these grips here uh i actually like this grip quite a bit it handles good it points good um uh, it doesn't soak up much of the recoil see now there's, there's nothing on the actual back of it so it's mostly just for finger grip um and it's a it's a bleed a hogue um but when i am i'm planning on swapping this grip out just because well it takes away from the, the classic look of the gun you know if you're going to have a Browning High Power, having something like this on it, uh, it's, it's not quite for me. So I'm going to look online and see what kind of grips there are. I'm going to see what the original grips look like um, and maybe do that. and uh, Or maybe some nice wood grips. It all depends on what I end up doing with the gun. I'm not going to do anything anytime soon. i got too many projects as it is. I've got the F uh, Israeli FAL to finish up. I've got the two tube guns i got to finish up. And uh, I'm looking at maybe getting my hands on a uh, Uzi kit to build to go with my Israeli gun kit. So, and I might trade this one off if I find myself in Israeli marked uh, FEG anyways. So, well, we'll see what I'm going to do with it. Now, these are available in the market if you look around. They pop up every so often. Um, I think they still show up in, in surplus imports here and there. Uh, normally they're running, you know, between 350 to 500 from what I've seen online. Um, which, you know, to me, uh, the 500, uh, might be a bit high, uh, for it. But if you find one of those ones that's somewhere under that, you know, between 450 to 350, definitely jump on it because uh, you won't be disappointed. It's a great shooting gun, especially if the barrel's good on it. Um, and like I said, they, they're compatible with most browning high power parts so it's a great gun 
Uh, not none too special as far as the markings on it goes, but you know, it, it is what it is. This particular one's not a surplus uh, one, but like I said, I got it part of a trade, and uh, well, I traded a 22 handgun. I traded my Star 22 for it. So personally, I think I did okay on it. Uh, you know, about the same value. But anyways, guys, that's the FEG model PJK 9HP made in Hungary. The brown and high power clone. If you can get them across one, do it. Get it, you know. And uh, you know, let me know if you if you if you have one or if you have a real browning high power or if you have both of these. Let me know. Do you, do you how's it compare to a true browning? I don't have a true browning. I would like to have one, but I can't afford one. So if you have both, let me know how it compares um, as far as uh, handling and shooting, recoil, all that. And uh, I know some people who have uh, uh, YouTubers that have real brownings, but they have an FEG. And they take this as their range gun and beaters and keeps their, their nice browning, you know, as a safe queen. But, you know, anyways, guys, that's it for today. Y'all have a good one and uh, keep shooting.